you know, those traditional Mother's Day things. And I was like, no, you should just stay going in the order. You should stay and you should do Jonah this week. That's what you should do. And he's like, and he's probably setting me up for failure at this point. But he goes, well, what would, you, what would we do for Jonah? What would we do for Jonah? And I'm like, oh, I got, I got this. You can do this. this. And so I'm sitting there in his office, and my students know that this happens because I sit down in youth group. I sit in a chair. I don't like to stand in front of them. But when I get real excited about something that I'm preaching, I turn like this, and I get up on my knees, and I get, like, pumped. And so I'm sitting in his office, and he's like, well, what, what would you do about Jonah? And so I'm like... Let me tell you all these ideas that God's just given to me. And he looks at me and he goes, well, it sounds like you got your Mother's Day message. And I go, oh. Oh. So I kind of had a bad attitude a little bit about it for the several days up until about 30 seconds ago. But it's fine. But I think that's really interesting because as I'm telling Pastor Steve, this is what I would do. This is what I would say for Jonah I hear God telling me, this is for you, Crystal. Like, I got, this is for you. This isn't just for everybody else. And so today we're going to talk about Jonah, which isn't a traditional Mother's Day thing. And if you are a mom here, raise your hand. What's up, moms? We did it. We birthed them babies, right? Like, woo. If you're not a mom in here, you know a mom. So good job. Way to support a mom. All my students should be, like, pumped. Lauren was not excited at all when I was like, yeah, there you go. Okay, so Jonah isn't a traditional thing that we talk about on Mother's Day. There are four chapters in Jonah. I'm not going to go through all four of them. We could be doing this forever if we, if we wanted to. We did a four-week series in youth group on Jonah. And so I'm not going to go through all four chapters, but I'm going to give you a little synopsis of the first three chapters. Because if you didn't know about Jonah, he's got a lot that happens to him in, in those first three chapters, okay? So basically, Jonah's this dude, right? And he is a man of God, okay? He loves God. He knows of God's goodness. He has experienced God's grace, and he loves God, okay? So he's trucking along with God. And God comes to him, and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to the city of Nineveh, and I want you to tell those people the truth. I want you to go tell them what, what's up, okay? And Jonah, because he's smarter than God, he decides to run away from God, literally buying a ticket to get on a boat and go in the opposite direction because that's a good idea, apparently. So he does it, right? So he gets on this boat and he's going. And God is like, <laughs> funny. And so he causes this storm to come and to basically wake Jonah up. Literally, he's sleeping in the midst of this storm. How many of you knew that it stormed last night? Okay. Sometimes it's hard to sleep through a storm. And this is a storm that's rocking the boat. It's going crazy, okay? My daughter, three different times last night, comes into my bedroom. Mom, mom. She gets right up. Mom, it's, it's storming. Okay, Chloe, go back to bed. Thank you. Mom, can I sleep in your room? So Chloe sleeps in our room last night. Kinley has no idea it's storming at all. My mother-in-law is staying with us, and she had no idea it was storming. And so but storms often would wake you up, especially one that's rocking a boat, right? And so Jonah didn't know. So they guys, the guys that are on the boat, because he's not there alone, obviously, he, they come down and they're like, hey, what's going on? Do you, do you know anything about what's happening? Because we're about ready to die. And he wasn't upfront about it right away. But after they figured it out that he's running from God, then he's like, I'm running from God. Like, that's what I'm doing. And they're like... What the heck? And so then he says, well, just hurl me overboard, throw me into the ocean, the storm will stop, you guys will be fine, whatever. Okay, they didn't want to do that. These were somewhat good guys, apparently. They didn't want to just throw him overboard, so they tried to deter it. They threw some of their cargo over, whatever, but he, it didn't work. So finally, they tossed Jonah overboard, right? The storm stopped immediately, immediately. Jonah gets swallowed by this big fish, and it says big fish. Let's take a break there. It is, we say whale because that's easy to think about because whale is a, a big fish. But I don't think it was a whale. I don't think a lot of people think it was actually a whale. Just like we use apple to say fruit in the, you know what I'm saying? But I, it's just big fish. So we're going to call it big fish today, okay? We don't know what kind of fish. You can do that research and come let me know. I'm surprised Pastor Steve doesn't know, like, what exactly. Because you tell us things all the time. He, he thinks it's a snake. I'm not getting on that train. Um... <laughs> Anyway, so a big fish comes, swallows him up. He's hanging out in the belly of this fish 
for three days. Finally, he repents to God. He's like, I'm a terrible person. This is what I did. I tried to run from you. you I know your goodness. I know your grace. You know, help me because I'm in this fish. And so God causes the fish to vomit Jonah up, literally uses the word vomit, vomit Jonah up on dry land. He goes to the people of Nineveh. He tells them what's up. They turn to God. 120,000 people turn to God and woohoo, that's it. Jonah's over, right? That's what we think. How many of you think, like when, when you heard that story growing up, like that's where, that's where we think the story ends? It's not. Because there's a whole fourth chapter of Jonah being an idiot. And I love it. And I love it. Because I love it. And as I was, I was talking to Pastor about this and Joe in our, in our Torah club on Thursday, I was like, I love how stupid Jonah is. Because it makes me feel so much better when I am an idiot. So we're going to read Jonah chapter 4 and we're going to kind of dissect it as we go through and pull out pieces. Okay? It's only 11 verses, so it's not like we're reading like 80. Okay? I will let you get to your Mother's Day lunches. Because I want to eat also. Okay. So Jonah chapter 4. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. It seemed very wrong that the 120 people, 120,000 people decided to love God. It made him angry. He's an idiot. Okay, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry. Verse 2, he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Oh, my goodness. I just think it's funny. Slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. God, you're so good and it makes me so mad. You laugh. But that's what he's doing. God, I knew you're so gracious. I knew that you're so loving. I knew that if the people turned to you, that you would forgive them and that they would get to enjoy your graciousness. This is terrible. I hate it. And then he says, and then he goes on to say in verse 3, Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die. Okay. So then we go to verse 4. It says, But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat at a place east of the city. So he went into the city, he told them about it, and then he goes up east of the city, and he sits himself there on a hill, and he made himself a shelter, and he sat in it, Wait, made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen in the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade to his head and ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy. First time that he's happy. Um, verse 7, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. He is a little dramatic, I think. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah says, it is. I am so angry, I wish I were dead. Verse 10, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. And then it ends. And that's it. And that's the end of Jonah. It just ends. We don't hear about Jonah or anything ever again in the Bible, except for in the New Testament when Jesus is talking, and he's talking about, so was Jonah in the belly of the fish for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the tomb. You know, you remember that? But that's it. We don't hear any more about Jonah. We don't hear any more about his family. We don't hear anything about what happened to him. Uh, there's no blessings poured out. There, Jonah and God aren't riding off into the sunset, music playing. Like, there's nothing. It just ends. It's just over. And see, I want to, going back and looking at those verses, I want to start by saying, at the very beginning of chapter 4, what does, what does Jonah say to God? God, I knew of your goodness. I knew you would do this. So it's not like Jonah had never experienced God's goodness, right? It's not like Jonah had a bad attitude because he didn't know that God could be good, right? It's not like Jonah had a bad attitude because he was watching the people of Nineveh experience God's grace and he never experienced that for himself. See, Jonah was just like us. He walked with God. He loved God. He had a relationship with God. And he had a bad attitude anyway. 
How many of y'all have a bad attitude sometimes? I have a bad attitude every single day of my life. That's a true story. So, and, and I think it's funny that this is what, this is just, it just worked out that Jonah is what was ready for Mother's Day, that talking about Jonah's bad attitude is what God wanted me to talk about because this is, this is for me. Like, okay, I am, I am verbally expressing to you what God is working on in my heart every single day because I have a bad attitude. I had a bad attitude about coming here. Not that I wanted you guys to all, like, die like he wanted the people of Nineveh to die. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is I hate this. And I hate when God makes you do things that you don't want to do. And Jonah, his, his reaction to God, we laugh. But I have that reaction to God all the time. And I think you'd be lying if you said you didn't. God, I don't want to do that. Don't want to. For those mothers or parents out there, how many of y'all got kids that do that? Do you want to know my favorite things that my kids do? Not like that's sarcasm. Because I used to do this, and my mom lost it when I would do this. This thing right here. I do that to my husband sometimes. But that was Jonah's attitude, and he knew of God's goodness. That, that's what it, we, we need to wrap our minds around is the fact that Jonah had God. Jonah had a relationship with God. He had experienced God's goodness, that he walked with God. That's why God called him in the first place. God wouldn't have just called somebody that he just didn't even know. You know, I mean, God does stuff like that. But in this situation, he wanted somebody to go tell the people of Nineveh about the truth because he knew Jonah. He loved Jonah. Jonah walked with him. Jonah was a man of God. And so he trusted him. He thought he would go do it. And Jonah, then Jonah tried to run the other way. He tried to run the other way. Do you know how many times I try and run the other way from what God wants me to do? I tried to run the other way for what God wanted me to do in my life and in youth ministry for about 10 years. Guess what I'm doing right now? If God, when God makes you do things that you don't want to do, it's because he knows better than you. It's because he loves you. And just like we tell our kids, hey, I want you to do this thing that you don't really want to do, but I know that you need to do it because it's going to help you grow. It's going to help you change. It's going to help you become a responsible adult that isn't in jail. Like, I want you to do this because I love you. It's because God loves us. Right? And so... Jonah thought that he knew better than God. And Jonah's bad attitude made him think that he could decide whether or not he was going to obey God. God, I'll do this over here. But if you want me to go talk to those people over there, they don't deserve it. And I know better than you that those people don't deserve to hear the message. I, those people, they don't, they don't, those 120,000 people, they don't deserve what you have for them, God. But I will do this. If you want me to do this, I'll go over here and do this. He thought he knew better than God, and he was, his bad attitude was trying to decide what was best. His bad attitude was allowing him to make decisions on whether or not he was going to be obedient. But what's interesting is God didn't release Jonah from his task. He still made him do it. I like that. So every day, my kids come home from school, and I usually have a chore for them to do. I think it's good if kids do chores. I think it helps them, and I don't have to do it. And so I, <laughs> I usually have a chore for my kid to do. They come home from school. They get home about 345, and I let them have a little snack, and they can go, like, chill and relax, whatever. But then at 4 o'clock every day, I'm like, okay, it's time for the chore. Usually the chore is something like unloading the dishwasher or carrying their laundry to the basement. It's nothing like chopping wood in the backyard or anything. You know, don't call, don't call CPS on me. <laughs> Watch it, Morgan. Um, so she, so I have them do this, right? And usually it's the dishwasher. And they come in, and I'm like, girls, can you go do the dishwasher? And some days, oh, my goodness, some days it's amazing. And they go in, and they turn on their little Alexa, and they, like, do the dishes, and they're, like, singing. So, like, right now it's Lemonade Mouth from Disney Channel. You probably have no idea. But that's what they listen to right now. And they do the dishes, and it's amazing. And it's like Chloe and Kinley just frolicking in the kitchen, putting the dishes away. Other days, I'm like, girls, go do the dishes. And 
I will like, I will huff you if you keep it up. Okay? And so I'm like, go do the dishes. And so the whole time they're doing the dishes, they are complaining. They are stomping around. They're sh- slamming cabinet. And we have the soft close cabinet doors. So to slam them, you actually have to like slam them. And so they'll like let them soft close and they'll shut them, real, you know, try and make it a big deal. And so I still make them do it. I'm not going to be like, oh, just because you complained, you don't have to do the dishes now. Actually, because you complained, you're going to do the dishes and take out the trash, and you're going to go carry the laundry down, right? God didn't release Jonah from his calling just because he had a bad attitude, okay? He didn't release him from his calling. He wasn't like, oh, well, you have a bad attitude. Of course, yeah, do whatever you want. But notice how at the end of chapter 4, it just ends. There's nothing else. There's no... And God poured out a blessing on his, on his wife and his children and their children and all of this stuff. I'm not saying God, that Jonah didn't live a blessed life. Again, it doesn't talk much about it. Obviously, he was a man of God, so he experienced God's grace. He experienced his goodness. But it didn't say that God just opened up the heavens and just poured out blessings. I'm not just talking like financial blessings or whatever. I'm talking about spiritual blessings and, and generational blessings. It just stops. And I wonder if it's because... Jonah was obedient with a bad attitude. And sometimes when we're obedient with a bad attitude, we're still supposed to be obedient. God's not saying, go just because you got a bad attitude, now you can go do all the things that you don't want to do. But we miss out on God's goodness, and we miss out on, on the miracles that are around us when we have a bad attitude. And so going into this morning, I was like, okay, God, I don't want to miss out. On what you have for me, I don't want to miss out on what you want to do in the lives of those around me and the lives of my kids and and their kids and generational because I have a bad attitude and this freaks me out. See, Jonah missed God's joy in his life. These exciting things were happening around him. 120,000 people just turned and, and turned away from their wicked ways and started following God. And he had a bad attitude about it. Are you telling me if you saw 120,000 people decide to follow God that you're going to sit there and throw a fit like a brat on a hill? I would be like, this is amazing. Praise God. I'd be crying, calling my mom. Like, this is amazing. And Jonah had a bad attitude and he missed out on God's joy. He missed out on the miracles that were happening right in front of him. His bad attitude ruined his opportunity for joy. Attitude transforms your obedience to blessings. Again, I'm not talking about you obey God and he's just going to start like you get a new TV, you get a new car, you get a new house, you get a new wife. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But what I am saying is your obedience and you're going to start experiencing things in your life when you have a good attitude about it. Like, God, I want to serve you. God, I love you. God, I want what you have for me. And you're going to start seeing a transformation in in your life. You're going to start seeing joy. You're going to start seeing patience. You're going to start seeing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Right? (laughs) Good job, Manny. You're going to start seeing God's blessings reign in your life and your family's life and those around you because you have a good attitude. And when you have a bad attitude, it takes away God's possibility of pouring those things into your life. How are you going to see the goodness when you're so focused on the bad? How are you going to experience God's fullness in your life when you walk around with such a negative perspective on what God wants to do? God has so much goodness in store. And and Jonah had experienced God's goodness. Before he even got called, Jonah had experienced God's goodness. And it was when he called him to do something he didn't want to do that all of a sudden he's like, oh, never mind. Now I have a bad attitude. And so Jonah wasted an opportunity to have a good attitude and to share that with those around him. You see, a good attitude... With, or a bad attitude with a good action is a wasted opportunity. When we have a bad attitude, even if it's a good, oppor- a good action, it takes away the opportunity. It takes away what God has for us. And I know better than anybody that a bad attitude can, can really mess things up, right? I want you to think about Jonah for a second. So Jonah gets called to go to Nineveh. He gets called over here. 
and he tries and runs in the opposite direction. Think of how much time that took. Okay, getting on a boat, he's in, it doesn't say how long he's on the boat. Then, it, then he sinks to the bottom of the, of the um, sea, so he's down there, and then the fish swallows him, and that's three days. And then he has to still go tell them, and then he goes and he sits and he pouts for an extended period of time. We don't know. If he would have just did what God told him to do, and he went and did it, and he had a good attitude about it, okay, good, thank you, God, I'm going to go home now, and then went back home, he would have saved himself a ton of time. He would have saved himself a ton of stress. He wouldn't have gotten swallowed by a fish. He wouldn't have had these bad things happen to him. And I think about all the time where God wants me to do something, and I try and tiptoe around it or not do it, and all I'm doing is wasting God's time. All I'm doing is wasting the time of the people around me. The people, that I'm, the people of Nineveh could have heard the message way sooner than what they did. The people of Nineveh could have heard about God's goodness way sooner if, if Jonah wouldn't have been trapped in the belly of a fish. There are people that need to hear and need to see God's goodness in our lives. But we're over here arguing with God because we think we know better and we don't want to do that because we don't like those people. And that's me. So, But see, we look at the end. We look at the end of, of chapter 4. And I want to reread a couple of these places. So he's throwing a fit and he's telling God, like, you're so good and gracious and how dare you be so good? Let me die. And so then he goes and he sits. Or he's sitting right, he's sitting in this place. I assume it's probably on a hill somewhere. It can't be that comfortable, I wouldn't think. And this plant grows up around him. Okay? Do you at this point think that Jonah has just miraculously changed his heart? No. He's sitting there. So he knew, knows of God's goodness before, and he knows of God's goodness throughout this whole time. It's not a surprise to him. He has a bad attitude before. Now he's sitting on a hill, and he's having a bad attitude on the hill. So I assume that when Jonah went to the people of Nineveh, it wasn't like he had a bad attitude, then he got to Nineveh, his attitude changed, and then the people of Nineveh changed their heart, and then his bad attitude started again. It wasn't like there was a period in there where he all of a sudden got a good attitude. He was obedient he was obedient with a bad attitude. So he probably walked into the town of Nineveh, and it probably looked something like this. You guys better change, or God's going to destroy your city. Also, you're ugly. And then he walked away. If you think, if you think that that's not what happened, do you think he walked in there and he's like, Woo, what's up, guys? Let's go to lunch. No, he hated them. He had a bad attitude the entire time. Then he gets done, and then even in the midst of his bad attitude, God still, his, God's message still went forth. The people still changed because God can do anything to, despite how stupid we are. The people still changed, and then Jonah goes, and he sits on a hill, and he's sitting there. God, why did you make me do that? I knew that you were going to do that. And God says, Jonah, because I said so. And this plant grows, and he's comfortable for a minute. He, for the first time in his story, he had a good attitude about a plant. Then the plant dies, and it all's over, and now he's miserable again, and he asks God to kill him again. And his story ends, just sitting here. What if I just stopped the message just right here, and I just stayed sitting here? It would be pretty depressing. Right? When, when do you get up and leave? You, what'd you say? Not if I just sit here. Not if I'm just sitting here. And, and the last thing you see from Jonah is God yelling at him. I mean a righteous, loving, fatherly yelling. I don't mean like he's like, actually he might have been. I, I would have yelled at Jonah. But that's what we see of Jonah. Jonah's story ends on a hill with him in misery and God yelling at him, God reprimanding him. That's where it ends. And I just think, I don't want my bad attitude to cause my story to end sitting on a hill, complaining and God yelling at me. God yells at me awful lot, don't get me wrong, and I deserve it 99% of the time. Sometimes I think he's being unreasonable. <laughs> we'll work on that later. I don't want my bad attitude to be the reason that I miss out on God's goodness in my life. I don't want my bad attitude 
be, to be the reason that the people over here that need to hear his message don't hear it when they need to hear it. I don't want my bad attitude to be the reason that my story ends sitting on a hill complaining. I don't want God to yell at me. I don't like it when God yells at me. I'm 30 years old, and when my mom yells at me, I'm very, it makes me sad. Don't tell her I said that because sometimes I put on a front, and I'm like, let's go, Mom. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I don't, I don't want God, I don't want to miss out on what God has for me because I want to complain or I think I know better than God or I have a bad attitude because I don't want to have to do something that I don't want to do. You see, everything else in the story obeyed God without complaining. Think about it. He got in the boat, and God caused the storm to happen, right? That storm obeyed God instantly. It rose, and it fell. He immediately obeyed God. Even the people on the boat, they weren't even complaining. They were just like, well, we don't want to kill this poor, innocent guy. But when that's what it came down to, they tossed his butt over, and they didn't think twice about it. But they did it without complaining. Jonah sinks to the bottom, and the fish comes without complaining, he comes and swallows up Jonah, and poor fish just holds Jonah in his belly for three days. If anybody in this story has a right to complain, it is the fish. Because that fish had to hold that man in his belly for three days, and then when God said, go vomit that guy up on land, he went and did it without complaining. The, the plant grew and died without complaining. The worm ate away at the plant without complaining. The people of Nineveh changed immediately when, when um, Jonah gave him the message without complaining. And yet the person who loved God in this story, the person that God called, the man of God in this story was the only person that was complaining and had a bad attitude. Sometimes we ruin our witness to the people around us because we have a bad attitude. God, I don't want to have to go to church today. God, I don't want to have to work in the sound booth. I've never heard Carl say that. He seems to really enjoy it. God, I don't want to have to go be in kids' church today. God, I don't want to have to vacuum the floors. God, I don't want to have to do this. Even with our kids, God, I don't want to have to go to their soccer game. I hate their soccer games. They told me there's a, another one, like a, a makeup soccer game that we have to go to now. And I'm like, we're going to be sick that day. But I, sometimes you just keep doing things. And then I think, God, why do I have a bad attitude? Why? It's not their fault, it's my fault. What is wrong with me, God? I don't want to be sitting here on a hill in the scorching sun and my story just end with me complaining because I think that I know better than you do, God. I don't know better than God. I don't. I wish I did. I would make my life much easier if I knew what he had for me. But I know that God has these plans for me and God has these ideas for me and God has these things he wants me to do. And I know that he intentionally has me do things that I don't want to do because it's going to grow me and it's going to shape me and it's going to mold me. And that's what he wants for us because we're his children and he loves us and he wants us to be better and he wants us to be more like him. But oftentimes I, I'm going to speak from my eyes perspective, I'm not going to say you, you, that's on you. I sit here and I put myself on this hill and think about all the things that I have in my life that aren't the way that I want them to be. I think about all the reasons in my life that I should complain. I think about all the things that God wants to use me for. And I don't want to have to get out of my comfort zone. I don't want to have to go talk to the people I really don't like. I don't want to have to go serve in the ways that I really don't want to serve. And I have a bad attitude about it the whole time. Now, God's still going to make me do it because he's a good God and he knows what's best for me. But when I hear those words, because I said so, come out of his mouth, it's a little terrifying. But sometimes the because I said so is God changing our attitude. You see, we don't know what happened to Jonah. We don't know. He just, he's just there. We don't know. Did Jonah all of a sudden in the midst of that, did he have a change of heart? Did he go back to his family and he told them, you know what, God just did all these miracles and these 120,000 people got saved and, and God is just so good and he changed my life and he did all this stuff? Or how long did he sit on this hill complaining while God's yelling at him? We don't know. And I don't know what that means for me. I don't know at what point I'm going to stop complaining about things. Hopefully soon. But I don't know. 
And so I want to be able to give you a charge today to say, okay, guys, this is what we do. But again, this message is just as much for me, probably more. And so I'm sitting here going, what do we do now? What do we do? I don't know. I just know that I don't want to be sitting on a hill with God yelling at me because I have a bad attitude. I don't want to miss out on God's blessings. I don't want to miss out on God pouring his blessings and his love out to me and my children and their children and their families. Because I had a bad attitude when God called me to do something. Not even something bad, but something so good. God works us into his plan. He didn't need Jonah. If we think that God needed Jonah, we got a bigger problem. God didn't need Jonah. God doesn't need any of us. God could do it all with the snap of a finger and just leave us in the dust. But God wants to use us. He wants us to be a part of his plan because he loves us. Because when he is doing a miracle in 120,000 people, he wants us to be a part of us. He wants to high-five us at the end. Do you think that I high-five my kids at the end when they're complaining about doing the dishes the whole time? No. I'm like, they're like, Mom, we did the dishes. Awesome. Go to your room. Now, if they do the dishes and they're all excited, I'm like, yeah, awesome. Way to go. You can have some iPad time or you can go outside and play. But when we have a bad attitude and that's what we do the whole time, I don't think God is going to be there and be like, "Woo, yeah, you're awesome. He's going to be like, go to your room. Like, that was dep- like, what are you doing? And that's what happened with Jonah. I assume that that's some sort of timeout or, you know, because the three days in the fish as a timeout didn't seem to do it enough for him. So now he has to sit here on a hill. That's his timeout. What's he going to do with his timeout? What are we going to do with our timeout? Are we in timeout right now? I am in timeout a lot. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that means for us. I don't know what we're supposed to do. I don't have some grand charge to give you today to say this is how we change our attitude and here is five steps. Pastor always says 12 steps. Here are 12 steps to fix your bad attitude. All I'm going to say is that I want to be anybody but Jonah and I want to change my bad attitude. I want God to pour out his blessings on me and my family. I want to be a part of the miraculous things that he's doing. And I don't want to be so blinded by my bad attitude that I miss his goodness. I'm going to have Paul come back up. He's got a baby. Look at the baby. So it's Mother's Day, if you didn't know. And so I've asked Paul to come up, and he is going to sing the song, The Blessing. We all know The Blessing. May his favor shine upon you in a thousand generations. And I want you guys to sit there, whether you're a mother or not. If you're near a mother, put your arm around her. Show her some love. But I want you to sit in this moment, and I want you to think about the blessings that God wants to pour out to you. I want you to think about the blessings that God has for you and his goodness in your life. And some of us in here need an attitude adjustment. I'm not going to point fingers. Thank you, Forrest, for pointing a finger at me. You are going to get a spanking. Um, (laughs) Thanks, Tim. Some of us need an attitude adjustment. And this would be a great time to get that. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, God. Thank you for who you are in our lives, God. Thank you for loving us, God. Thank you for choosing us, God. Thank you for giving us a time out when we need an attitude adjustment, God. Thank you for letting us walk in your goodness and your grace every day of our lives, even when we don't have, we don't deserve it. God, when we have a bad attitude, maybe that bad attitude is controlling every single thing in our lives. God, help us change, help us be better. God, I don't want to complain. I don't want to spend my life on a hill. I don't want my story to end with a bad attitude. God, I don't, I don't want to miss your miracles in my life because I'm blinded by myself, God. God, thank you for who you are, God. Thank you for the love that you pour out, the forgiveness that you pour out, God, every single day, God. You are so good. You are so gracious. Thank you, Lord, for who you are for who you want to be in our lives for choosing to use us when you don't have to God you are so good just continue to be in that attitude as prayer as Paul sings Lord bless you and keep you may his face 
shine upon and be gracious to me. Lord, turn his face toward you and give him peace. Lord, bless you. shine upon and be gracious to me. Lord, turn his face towards you and give him peace. Amen. Amen. children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children bless you and keep you. His face does smile upon you. He has changed the countenance of your face and even your heart this morning. And on this morning, if you have family with you, I want you to get together because we're going to pray a mother's blessing. Amen. Now, if you don't have your children with you, then grab somebody and say, I love you. And I know you must be a mother or you had a mother. Amen. You had a mother that was a vessel that God used and knit you together inside of her. So I'm going to pray a blessing. Find someone, love them, hug them. You know, amen. You got somebody? All right, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, <laughs> you are so good to us. 
your blessings abound to us. And, and Father, you, you planned mothers even before the foundation of the world. You said it would be a good thing to have a family unit to, to love each other and to strengthen each other. And God, I pray this morning that you bless mothers. I ask you to strengthen them. Anoint them with the presence of your spirit. And God, cause them to know how important they are to you and the influence that they have on their children. And God, I thank you that you ordained them to be mothers. I thank you for families, the greatest institution there is, a family plan before a church even. And God, we thank you. Bless every mother. Give her a blessed, holy wonderful day and father just draw our hearts close to you help us to know you help us to appreciate our mothers god thank you god you're great and greatly to be praised i ask you to bless families bless mothers help us to rejoice in you and go forth god with a good attitude and use us for your kingdom i pray in jesus name and everyone says amen, amen. god bless you mothers and fathers and children, God bless you all.